Uh, but we're really excited to announce this year's winners of the Lima Rosenthal Prizes for Leaders in Open Social Science. My name's Sean Grant. I'm a behavioral and social scientist at the RAND Corporation, but I'm also a BITS catalyst, a former Lima Rosenthal winner, a smart grant recipient. All this to say, um, BITS has had a tremendous impact on my career, both previously and looking forward. It's great to have a community where we actually feel valued as individuals for doing this work. It can be risky, um, but it's terribly important. And so in addition to all of the research that BITS funds and does, looking at things at more of a macro level and disciplines, uh, I'm really honored to present these prizes to recognize individuals who appear at pioneering both the education and capacity building of leaders in this space internationally, as well as those who are conducting research to help us understand what the state of play is and what potential solutions are moving forward. So without further ado, we're gonna quickly introduce each of the winners this year, who are selected by a panel of BIT staff and catalysts, and then lead a quick Q&A if you have any questions for any of the catalysts before we go into the reception and carry the conversation forward. So our first uh, prize recipient is Dr. Daniel Lachens, who's an assistant professor of psychology at Idaho University in Technology. He's an experimental psychologist whose work focuses on reward structures in science and applied statistics. His MOOC, Improving Your Statistical Inferences, has over 10,000 students enrolled, and he has given over 40 workshops on open science and improving research practices. He co-edited with Brian Nozick a 2014 special issue of Social Psychology with pre-registration, replication studies, and he has published extensively on meta-analysis, statistical methods, and research reproducibility. Uh, join me in congratulating Dr. Lockins if you come join us. Have a seat. Hopefully, we won't have anyone blocking the PowerPoints by the end of it. Yeah. Our next winner in the Leaders in Education is Dr. Samin Vazir, who's an associate professor of psychology at UC Davis. She's the director of the Personality and Self-Knowledge Laboratory at UC Davis, and she teaches courses on research methods, replicability, personality, and self-knowledge. She conducts meta-science examining how people interpret specific scientific findings and tracks trends in the methods and results of published studies in psychology over time. She's a senior editor at Collabora Psychology, editor-in-chief of Social, Psych Social Psychological and Personality Science, and co-founder and president of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Vizier. Right, and on to some folks you haven't seen yet tonight. Moving to our emerging researchers, our next prize recipient is Ms. Erica Baranski. She is a PhD student in personality psychology at UC Riverside. Her research focuses on the cross-cultural examination of situ situational experience, as well as the volitional personality change process. In the area of research transparency, she has conducted meta-scientific studies on ethical research practices, and the improvement for psychological science. She's been involved in the Many Labs three and five projects, the Reproducibility Project in Psychology, an Open Science Collaboration Project, and the Institutional Reengineering for Ethical Discourse in STEM. She's been an active Center for Open Science Ambassador, presenting on open science at various conferences and trainings across the US, and has co-authored a recent paper about the open science badges. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Baranski. Our next winner is Mr. Charles Abersoll. He is a PhD candidate in social psychology at the University of Virginia. He studies research practices in meta-science, where he conducts crowdsourced investigations of factors that influence the replicability of past research. These include the Many Labs 3 and 5 projects, which we just heard about, as well as being involved in the creation of StudySwap, an online platform for researchers and labs to share resources like access to samples, not to date. I think that we got that correction earlier, right? It's not a dating website. It's for sharing samples and study participants, okay? 
Mr. Abersoll has been involved in the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science and has given workshops on using transparent research practices. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Abersoll. gender separation on stage. Oh, I didn't like to. <laughs> <laughs> Our next prize winner is Mr. Ranjit Law. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Government at Harvard University. His research interests are in the area of international political economy with the focus on international institutions, global governance, financial regulation, and quantitative methods. His interest in open science was inspired by the difficulties he personally encountered and acquiring data to replicate past studies. He has since replicated, and I think I'm reading this right, 35 studies and published findings in political analysis and comparative political studies. His research has been published in international organization, political analysis, comparative political studies, regulation and governance, and the review of the international political economy. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Law. Our next winner is Dr. Joshua Polanin. He is a principal researcher in education, criminal justice, and research methodology at the American Institutes of Research. His recent work focuses on the use and reporting of meta-analytic statistical significance testing, and his substantive experience is in the intersection of education and criminal justice, serving as the principal investigator of a large-scale systematic review and meta-analysis on the longitudinal consequences of school violence with support from the National Institutes for Justice. His work has been featured in several journals such as the Review of Educational Research, the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, and Research Synthesis Methods. In addition to his research, he's also published and trained researchers on meta-analytic packages in R, and he earned his PhD in research methodology with a focus in quantitative methods at Loyola University Chicago. Please join me in graduating Dr. Polanin. So our next winner is Dr. Karthik Ram. He is a senior data scientist at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science and a co-founder of the R OpenSci project, which develops R packages that facilitate access to data repositories. He is also a senior principal investigator at Berkeley's Initiative for Global Change Biology, and his interests in reproducible research lie in its applicability to global change. Much of his recent work focuses on building tools, and services around open data and growing diverse data science communities. Please help me in congratulating Dr. Ram. shadow puppets, but it's only a few minutes longer. And our final winner that we'd like to congratulate tonight is Ms. Soazik Elise Wang Son. She is a PhD candidate in economics and governance at the United Nations University. Her research focuses on the application of microeconomic impact evaluation techniques to understand which interventions work better to increase women's empowerment, labor-saving technology adoption, and children's health and schooling in sub-Saharan Africa. As a BITS catalyst, she has led trainings on openness and transparency in Cameroon, South Africa, the UK, the Netherlands, and the US, with her efforts leading to the exposure and training of over 150 researchers in transparent and open social science. Please can help me in congratulating Ms. Wang Song.
So we have about 15 minutes, and this is very free-flowing and open. I see previous winners in the audience today, as well as those who might be interested in applying for the future or other activists in this space. So if you have any questions for the Catalyst about their previous experiences, thoughts going forward, the floor is yours. Kelsey. So what, uh, anyone who wants to take it, what inspired you to get involved in research transparency in this, in this area? Uh, I'll take a shot at this. Um, I think about seven years ago, I was a postdoc uh, trying to start a big data project or getting involved in a project that had just started. And um, the idea was that a whole bunch of data had already been collected and processed and everything was ready to go. And in four months, we should have a paper out. But then uh, as I started working through the data, I could not uh, retrace the provenance of the data. And then I spent uh, 11 months recollecting and reprocessing all of the data. And so that's when I realized there was absolutely no workflow, uh, no best practices around reproducible data. And then that's what inspired me to start doing this with my own work. Uh, I started grad school um, five years ago, I guess, and it, that was the point where uh, things were kind of emerging, surfacing um, in some explicit ways, it seems. And so uh, I really, I got to kind of, I was introduced to this whole issue um, and, and everybody was surprised that, uh, that all of these things were coming out and it just seemed really, it, it's always seemed really, um, I don't know, that that people should be doing, or researchers should be doing things the right way. And that was, that people were surprised that researchers weren't doing things the right way. And so that kind of uh, made me want to know more about the issue and how to um, help push forward uh, the way that, the right ways to do it. And so some of that is meta science, and some of that is learning uh, as a researcher, emerging researcher, how to keep doing those, those things correctly. Certainly resonates with my experience. Uh, aspirational goals of things being better as well as people not doing this be a pain in the butt for my own work and everything in between, so great. Any other questions for the group? We've got about 13 minutes left. <laughs> or is everyone thirsty? <laughs> and, and please introduce yourself so we know who's attending. And... Okay, examples for convincing the skeptics. Um, so I would say uh, the most likely person to benefit from the documentation and sharing of my research workflow uh, is typically me six months from now. Um, so research is a long and difficult process. You do analyses, you do more studies, you write it up, you go back to those analysis scripts, you can't remember what you did you know, six months, a year ago, you don't remember what you named all the variables. And I have found that in making my materials accessible to others, I'm really just making them accessible to myself in saving me a lot of time in the future. Um, something else I've noticed is by sharing things, especially sharing data, uh, that potentially helps me personally in terms of impact of research. People come along with new questions that they answer with my data that I never would have thought of, and then they cite me. Um, so for, for the skeptics, I, I would say, you know, ideals are great but appealing to our self-interest is great too. In a lot of open science practices that I've done, I tend to see a, a pretty tangible positive effect just for me personally. So if, if for nothing else, do it for your, your own sanity and citation count in the future. Yeah, I, I certainly second the uh, six months later <laughs> uh, aspect. The, the one other thing I'd say is, so I, I work primarily in meta-analysis, and so I think your question is applicable there, um, <clears throat> not only to yourself six months later, but to future researchers six years later or 16 years later. Uh, one of the really fun things that I get to do <clears throat> when I do meta-analyses is um, we'll collect dissertations or, or master's theses, and some of these dissertations can be quite old or even just a few years old. And we'll sometimes contact the authors and say, um, you know, you're missing something, we'd like your data, 
or we just have this question for it. And they'll generally they'll shoot back an email like, oh, I didn't know anybody was reading <laughs> my dissertation. I didn't know anybody was reading this paper. Um, and um, they're often forthright about their results. But I think the, the point is that um, another potential audience is the meta analyst and, and making it open and transparent will promote um, not only the sharing of data, but then also the use of it later on. And so that can be really impactful um, to yourself, but also to the, to the field in general. Yeah, so I, this, this may um, sound a little self-serving, but I, I, my um, project was a, a large-scale replication and reanalysis exercise, and, uh, and I eventually was able to, to publish the findings. Um, actually, conducting the exercise was, was not easy. Um, I encountered several obstacles, uh, most notably getting the data in the first place. I, I, would, I would email uh, authors. I would often get a hostile response, no response. I would follow up. Uh, but eventually, I, I did get um, data sets of, of 35 of these studies that were, were published in two uh, prominent journals, and uh, I was able to replicate uh, the original results in each case, and then I reanalyzed them. And then when it came to actually publishing my results, um, again, it wasn't easy. Sometimes the, the, the paper would get sent to uh, authors of the studies I was replicating. You know, you can imagine what, what their response was. Um, but eventually, it did happen, and I think this is sort of um, indicative of, of the general progress we're making, you know, Edison's work. I, I felt uh, as I, um, uh, you know, as I carried on trying, Edison became more and more open to, to publishing this this kind of replication study, um, and eventually it happened. So uh, there's sort of light at the end of the tunnel. So um, I agree with everything everyone said, but there is one downside to practicing open science, which is. If you share your data, your code, and your papers and everything else, it just leads to a lot more collaboration. People just want to give you grant money. People want to write you into papers, and it just creates a lot more work for you. <laughs> so I think ever since I started doing open science, I've just been contacted by funders. People wanted to use my data set and then add something else to it, or write me into grants, and then I just constantly am snowed in with work. Maybe so people hit you up on Twitter to write a paper together. It just sounds awful. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Don? Uh, Top priority in open and transparent social science research. Any first, any of the respondents haven't responded yet? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think my prize is more related to the fact that I did a lot of trainings on research transparency in the African context. So I managed to train in Cameroon, which is in Central Africa, but also in South Africa. And I also managed to have, uh, during my trainings across the Europe or the US, uh, people also coming from other parts of Africa. So I can say I managed to cover almost all the different parts of Africa throughout the research transparency training that I provided. And one of the key feedback that always come in terms of how can we really change the rules and which kind of institution can we really target in order to really uh, make the change of transparency is that most of the African scholars believe that uh, it's very difficult for so senior researchers, so their supervisor, to really embrace the, open, the openness and transparency world in such a case that they are mostly, they are get, really getting used to the way they used to do their research, so the traditional rule of hygiene, your research papers, because in the, even in the specific case of Africa, it's even difficult for senior researchers to share their papers. So it's not even about sharing the data, but even sharing a paper that has been published, people are hiding it. So there's a culture of hygiene and also a culture where the, those senior researchers are not really uh, ready to, read, to share the data and everything. So I think if there is a change, especially in the case of Africa, that we would like to see is that uh, training has also to be targeted to those senior institutions or senior researchers so they can also uh, understand the benefits of really being open of, for increasing the uh, credibility and validity of results that are purchased for evidence uh, policy making in the context of Africa. Yeah. Uh, continuing my theme of being selfish as a fifth year grad student, I'll say hiring uh, is the, the, the next important or the, the big important frontier on these things. I think there's been 
uh, a lot of gains uh, in this area in terms of getting changes in behaviors, getting researchers bought in. My experience has been that there's been a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of these practices, uh, especially at the junior levels of, of research and in our research community. I think a big struggle going forward will be managing retention of uh, people who are endorsing these practices and putting them into, into good use. Uh, if folks who are adopting these things are not staying within the research community or not staying active within these uh, fields, uh, we may lose a lot of the progress that we've gotten. I think grad students and junior faculty uh, folks are very sensitive to incentive structures, I think with good reason. Um, and making sure that those incentive structures for the, the people we want to keep in our community reflect uh, these ideals and are trying to select on these ideals, I think will go a long way to long-term change by, by keeping folks in the field who, who are trying to make these changes and adopt them. So I'm guessing Don was expecting answers like pre-registration or replication or open data. <laughs> But I want to echo both of these comments earlier. I think one of the really, really big problems that got us into this mess is uh, status and revering certain people and certain institutions and certain regions of the world and so on and assuming that those people can't do wrong or that once you have that status that, um, yeah, you're given a cer certain amount of privilege and, and benefit of the doubt. And I think that got us into a lot of mess. So I think everything we can do to evaluate work on its own merits to not allow people to appeal to status in defending practices or findings or whatever. If we can get rid of that and make, I mean, ironically, I think a lot of this means getting this debate out in the open, making the debate itself transparent, because I think so much happens behind the scenes, so much of the pressure to, to kind of stop these reforms is happening using arguments that are only made in private and would not stand up in public. So I think bringing these arguments out in public, having as many open discussions and debates as possible, social media helps with this, but there, it needs to happen offline too, um, and not assuming that somebody's status is relevant to the strength of their argument in these debates or to the strength of their findings in science. Um, so one big change that I would like to see is moving away from seeing publications as the only scholarly output and recognizing that people produce a lot more. So these can include things like data sets, software, methods, implementation of methods, because it's very unfortunate to have uh, a paper that is not read or cited uh, count more than a piece of software that you wrote that is used by 200,000 people every month. And so uh, again, echoing that comment that we should sort of shift the conversation away from the way we've done things before uh, is sort of the key going forward. So one of, one of the experiments that I'm trying out right now is uh, a new journal that I helped create last year called the Journal of Open Source Software. And our biggest uh, goal is to become obsolete in less than five years because we are effectively publishing what looks like a, a, a publication describing the software so we can count that as a citation, but we shouldn't have to do that in order to get credit for research software. Same thing for data, and then you think of everything else that goes into the whole research process. Thank you, so interesting. Less about practices and more about culture and community change. Uh, I think we have time for one final question, if there's any burning thought out there. Please. Barriers, setbacks, and what facilitated your perseverance, your resilience? Did you have anything? I said. Sure. So, <laughs> so um, I, I do think it happens because uh, people are are worried about yeah. If you publish a replication, mentioned people mentioned before, or just challenge the way that they've been working, um, and uh, but I think that many of the things that are being proposed just make so much intuitive sense. Uh, that you feel that they are the right thing to do, and uh, I think you can never really regret uh, doing doing the right thing. Uh, even if you're a very young scholar, you might think, "I'm not sure if I'm going to make it in science." I don't think anybody really regrets doing the right thing and then not making it in science. Uh, if you look back, then uh, you did the right thing, so you should be, uh, uh, yeah, sort of uh, happy with that at the very least. So that sort of commitment 
focusing on that. That's sort of what I uh, try to do. And I think if I would have been out of science, which should, you know, could have been possible, then I, I wouldn't have regretted any of these choices in any case, because they're just the right thing to do. Um, uh, so I'm a smart grant recipient as well, and um, we finished our uh, paper and we tried, we submitted it to a journal, and I apologize if one of the reviewers is in here because I'm about to call you out. Uh, and our paper's on, uh, we're, I'm gonna talk about it tomorrow, but it's on data sharing for meta-analysis. And the very first comment was, oh, this is an interesting paper, but it would have been great two to four years ago because I feel like the culture has changed now where everybody just shares their data. And um, I like just immediately like closed the review and was like, okay, I'm just done with this journal <laughs> for now. Um, and so I would say if there's a negative experience, it would be <laughs> peer reviewers not being receptive to, uh, to, my, to data sharing in general. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think that there is a, uh, one of the things that we learned that I'll talk about tomorrow and uh, we did a survey um, asking people about their data sharing habits and, and how they felt about sharing data. And there's a lot of concern, uh, rightly, about um, how data will be used and who will use it in the future and uh, will they still get credit for all this hard work that they've gone into it. Um, and I think there's a lot of, pre and, or, and not to mention institutional review boards and funders, what do they do with it? So I think there's a lot of practical concerns and constraints um, that we still need to figure out as a community and how to uh, conduct this one small aspect of transparency data sharing that, that I'm interested in. Um, but there's still, so there's still challenges to overcome. So it's not necessarily negative, but there's still definitely issues to, to figure out. Uh, one of the challenges that um, Charlie kind of touched on earlier uh, that's relevant for psychology at least, is uh, when you're a grad student and you are focused on uh, meta science and um, replication attempts, there's pushback in whether or not that counts as sort of uh, part of your, um, your substantive research or uh, your um, not service. <laughs> and uh, so pushing back against that is packaging yourself as uh, a meta scientist um, in addition to whatever field of interest you're in, and not necessarily as somebody that does re uh, replications, but um, trying to instill in uh, whoever you're trying to instill something in, uh, that uh, meta science is science, and uh, it's just a matter of uh, the unit of analysis, um, and it shouldn't necessarily be considered part of your service section of your CV. Um, and then that will, legitimize the <laughs> half of your research <laughs> package. Yeah, I, I, when I did my um, replication study, I, as I mentioned before, I got some hostile responses from authors when I would request data. Um, when the study came out, um, I mean, I, apparently I got some abuse on online forums and things like that, I'm, I'm told, I didn't actually look at them. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And you know, I was I was um, on the job market at the time as well, and people would tell me you did a brave thing. The euphemism would be brave. You know, you're very brave in doing this. Um, but I think overwhelmingly, it's you know, people you know, have been encouraging, and have said, yeah, I mean, it's um, yeah, it was a brave thing to do. But someone, we all acknowledged that there was this big problem in the field, and I was focused specifically on missing data, um, and and techniques for handling missing data. And um, I think many people, many people have generously said that this is a, this is a service to the field and um, and to the discipline more broadly, uh, and that's great encouragement. You know, throughout the project, um, I would receive encouragement at each stage from my advisors, from other people, um, and so I would say overall the, the positives definitely outweigh the negatives. But um, there were a lot of sort of uh, roadblocks along the way. Yeah, I think a lot of people I know, and myself included, have experienced a lot of um, negative consequences. But I would say that organizations like BITS and, and uh, social media, and especially early career people who are, you know, are joining the discussion and making really good points, I think that outweighs by far all the negative things in the comments sections. And yeah, don't read the comments. <laughs> I think there is a lot 
a, a really, really big and vibrant community that appreciates uh, honest discussion and criticism and so on. Um, not and and will support people who work for that, not in a knee jerk kind of way, not unconditionally, but just you know in a balanced way. So I think there is resistance and there is a lot of um, yeah pushback, and that can be disheartening. But I think that there's also a lot of appreciation out there for this kind of work, and so I would keep that in mind too. Although the setbacks are are hard sometimes. So. One thing I'd say in this in this topic is that a lot of the pushback that everybody talked about was something that we experienced a, a few years ago. So there's a lot of culture change that I've seen happen in just the last five to six years, and it was much, much stronger than it is now. So now when you talk, again, it's all context dependent and field dependent, but for example, like my PhD advisor in 2008 was very upset that I was using open source software and he could not trust the outcome. And he promised me one day that if I just use proprietary software, he would pay for a license for it for the rest of my life. And um, to this day, he, uh, not to this day, but like about once a week, I get an email from him saying, do you know you could do this with open source software? This is really cool. <laughs> and he's the editor in chief of a major journal who was just very annoyed with people wasting time sharing code, sharing data, and now constantly talks to me about how do we implement a new data sharing policy. And I've seen that with many mentors over the past who just complained and said, this is just a waste of time to, my lab does this now, what do you think? And so I, I, it's changed quite a bit, but there's still a long way to go. Great, well, I think that's a great uh, question to end on. Uh, with all of the pushback, challenges, and whatnot you've all faced in doing the work you do, thank you for persevering, for your resilience, for being a model for others, an inspiration. And while we might have different ideas on how to get there, know that you have this community and not just you up here, but everyone here has this community of those who are interested in the pursuit of transparency and openness. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope this is a catalyst for you to continue this work going forward. So thank you. Thank you.